Good morning, Lighthouse. Can you guys please stand and join us in some worship?
tries to fight We know the great Redeemer The way, the truth, the life Let all that I Armies of angels run into battle shouting your name. I'll sing of your victories through all of my days. No matter the cost, I'll run into battle shouting your name. I'll sing of your victories. I'll have it Armies of angels.
Yes, indeed. Yes, it's so good to gather together on a Sunday morning and praise the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I was going through a short devotion today, and, and we all know this verse in Romans, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then it continues, and it says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. So amen. So we celebrate that here today, and we also celebrate our children's ministry, and we have Jenny Swafford here to tell us a little bit about that. Good morning, church. Today we want to honor our children's ministry. Um, they are such an amazing, dedicated group of volunteers who love loving on our kids. And they provide such a vital and important ministry for our church. Not only do, does it allow all you d adults to be in here without, you know, distractions, but they're actually learning God's Word on their level, where it makes sense to them, where, where they can understand. So today, I'm going to ask everybody to tell a children's ministry volunteer thank you, whether it's check-in or nursery or Sunday school. And... Um, we just want them to know how much we appreciate them. And also, if any of you are considering being in children's ministry, we could use some more of you to be on our team. So there is a little sign-up sheet out there at the check-in counter, should you be interested. I will love to connect with you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you so much. Yeah, so like I said, get signed up to help out the little kiddos, get high fives and all of that. Um, so we've got a ton going on here um, starting into the fall pretty quickly, right? Um, we've got a, a women's ministry Bible steer, series. Um, it's already begun, but there's a few open spots. So if you would like to um, sign up and get involved in one of those Bible studies that's coming up, um, there's, there's some room in some of those uh, studies. And then we um, had planned for a ministry fair next Sunday, but we're going to move that back till October. And so there'll be more information on that, but there'll also be some time there to sign up for more discipleship classes um, if you've been looking forward to that, that'll be in October. And then um, even further planning out in um, February of next year, um, who here has been to a weekend to remember up, up in Boise? A, a few of us, yeah. So that's a great time. Talk to one of us if you've been there because it's an awesome time. But they're running a, a special right now, 50% um, off. So um, you can get that in your budget and get it paid for. Um, and that runs through, I think, the 16th. Is that what that says? Yeah, through the 16th, you can get that half price uh, special to be able to go to that awesome weekend. And then um, next weekend in the Grindhouse, uh, we'll have our youth fundraiser. Um, the, our youth director, Jed Hilt, and his uh, crew are going to be busily making candles that are personalized for each of the um, students in his um, youth ministry so that you can um, donate to get those and you can pray for each one of those students and that uh, those donations go to help um, all the things that they do in youth ministry, which is a ton. And so I would encourage you to stop and talk to one of them, um, Jed, and see what they're, what they're doing there. They do a lot. And then um, one of the things we have coming up um, next month is 24-7 prayer. So I'd like to have Susie Heath come up and tell us a little bit more about that. So give her a hand. Okay, does anyone know what this means? Raise your hand if you recognize this. Yes, that is great. We are gearing up for our next 24-7 prayer weekend, October 11th, 12th, and 13th. So we take the prayer baton, and we go into the prayer room, pray for an hour. Then we come out all refreshed, and we pass it to the next person, to the next person for a full 24-7 all weekend long. Is that great? And this time, we are going to... Um, pray that the Lord will help us fill two prayer rooms. That means we would be doubling up on the amount of people praying for the weekend. We will have our regular 24-7 prayer room and our overflow prayer room. Isn't that a great term, overflow? We're overflowing in prayer. So I need you to all sign up. Those of you that have signed up before, please come. Those of you that have never joined us, we need you to, to fill up those prayer rooms and you can bring your, you can do it by yourself. You can bring your Bible study group, your small group, your school staff, your sports team, your neighborhood, just any group that would like to come and pray together, you are welcome. So sign up. I'll look for you out in the lobby. And uh, let's pick not only our preferred time, but our preferred location. So thank you, and we'll see you after service. That's right. Yes, indeed. And, and no fighting over those 3 a.m. spots, okay, guys? 
be Christian about it. All right. Um, one thing I did, did mean to bring up when I was talking about the youth, um, they, they get dismissed after the last song right before the message. And so if you're new here for that, um, that's the time that you'll leave for um, youth group and you'll just go out the auditorium into the back building. And um, some of those other youth will be able to direct you back there. So I'd just like to thank you also for, you know, we, you notice we don't pass a plate, and, you know, but our tithes and offerings that, that you guys are faithful uh, to give each, each week and each month, uh, they go a long way to help doing the Lord's work here, so we appreciate you for that. And now it's a, my, one of my favorite times here where we get to stand up and we get to meet and greet one another, so just stand up and go all the way over to the other side of the building here and meet somebody you haven't met, because we got people over here too, so bless you guys. all stand as we continue to worship this morning.
into my senses me begin my crumbling you give me my portion the flesh and heart may fail me your strength is there to hold me keeping my heart steady
can be seated. Good morning, Lighthouse. Hi, I'm John, and I'm with the Celebrate Recovery Ministry, and also help check in your kids. Um, Woohoo! If you would stand today for the reading of the word, we're going to read from Mark chapter two, verses thirteen through twenty-eight. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, To those who are well, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of untrunk cloth on a new garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins." but new wine is for fresh wineskins. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and in the presence of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even on the Sabbath. You can be seated. Let's pray. Lord, I love that through the the Gospels, and, and for us, the Gospel of Mark, how um, we see you for who you are, your heart, your character. And Lord, if, if your word is true, and it is, then we've been saved by grace through faith, and then we're currently in the process of being conformed into your image that we are beginning to think your thoughts after you and to do the things that you did, say the things that you said. So let your word this morning be just a fresh, eye-opening glimpse at your life, at your heart, who you are, and let it impact us, Lord, making us more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to get to know Jesus a little bit better this morning. Anybody ready for that? You up for that? Anybody excited about that? Come on, give me some help here. Come on. Okay, so five. We're going to pull out five. We'll see if we can get to them. We're going to try our best. So five things we learn about Jesus from this passage. The first thing, Jesus is a disciple maker. 
Jesus is a disciple maker. Again, verse 13, Jesus went out again beside the sea. All of the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, the, uh, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And Matthew rose and followed him. So this is super interesting. Jesus is back at his adopted hometown. Remember, he grew up in Nazareth, but he got kicked out of Nazareth. And now he's in Capernaum as his adopted hometown. And he goes down to the beach, a crowd, remember, everybody's talking about him. He's done a lot of miracles up there now. And a crowd follows him down to the beach. And biblical historians tell us that Capernaum was a town of about 1,200 to 1,800 people. So think Shoshone. Shoshone's got, um, as of 2022, Shoshone has uh, 1,702 people, according to the census. So about that size of a town. And, uh, and so to this point, Jesus has, in this town, he's healed a good number of people. He's cast demons out of people. He healed a paralytic guy whose four friends brought him to Peter's house, right, where Jesus was. The house was packed. They couldn't get in. They dug in through the roof and lowered their friend down, and Jesus healed him. And he contended with the local scribes who were cynical about Jesus saying, you know, I forgive your sins, like only God can do that, and they were right. What they didn't factor in was that they were looking at God incarnate in Jesus. But now Jesus does another very surprising thing, and it is very surprising. He's walking along the beach, the crowd's following him, and he stops at a tax booth, think a toll booth, you know, there's a guy in a booth. And he stops, Tax booths, were, they were set up and occupied by people who were employed by the Roman Empire to extract taxes from the people for Rome. So they're working for the oppressors, <laughs> these people, the tax collectors. Not that tax collectors today are that popular, but these guys were really unpopular, really unpopular. This person, Levi, alias Matthew, was a Jew working for the oppressing tyrannical Roman Empire, taking money from the Jews and giving it to Rome. And not only that, Jewish tax collectors were known as traitors and extortionists because they worked for Rome and they had the force of the Roman soldiers behind them to force people into paying their taxes. So they could, they could put the pressure on to get the money out of the people. And so some of their duties were legitimate, but, but the tax collectors, they were known for cheating their own people by collecting more than what was required. So they would get a contract with the Roman Empire, I'm gonna take care of this area, and they, they would agree on a certain amount that would be collected, and the tax collector would then pad what he collected. And so, it was really robbing the people of God. And many of these tax collectors became wealthy. And so a Jew being a tax collector made the individual an outcast, a pariah, hated. Because of their reputation, tax collectors would have been forbidden from entering synagogues, they would have been cut off from Jewish community, places of worship. They probably would have been disowned by their families. So tax collectors were the most despised individuals in all of Israel. They were deemed lower than the Herodians, the Romans, and the Roman soldiers, and they were regarded essentially on the same level as prostitutes and, and harlots. So the Jewish Talmud taught that it was righteous to lie and deceive a tax collector because that was what a professional extortioner deserved. I know some people who think that that's true today. <laughs> so these guys are so bad, it's okay if you lie to them. It's okay if you cheat on your taxes, they're cheating you. 
So Jesus alluded to this when he taught in Matthew 18 about how to settle personal issues amongst each other. He said, if someone sins against you, go to that person in private, show them their sin that you may gain your brother. Now, if they don't receive what you have to say, take one or two others with you and then go to them and, and again, share the issue. And if they don't receive it, then you gotta tell it to the church. And if they don't receive it from the church, then you gotta treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector. Matthew 18, 17. So, in other words, don't have fellowship or relationship with them at that point. So Jesus comes up to this tax booth with Levi slash Matthew in it. No doubt the crowd that is with the Lord is sneering at the guy, they hate the guy, and Jesus says to this tax collector, Follow me. And I have no doubt the people around Jesus were like, what? What? Matthew quit his job on the spot, stepped out of his booth, began to follow Jesus from that moment on. A tax collector. Despised, scumbag tax collector. Put yourself in Matthew's sandals. You're the tax collector, and your fellow Jews despise you, your family's disowned you. This, this miracle-working, demon-commanding rabbi called Jesus says, follow me. It was an invitation to discipleship. Jesus was saying, Levi, I, I want you to be my disciple. I want you to go where I go and learn to do what I do. I want you to do life with me. Follow me. Matthew understood that Jesus' invitation was life-changing, literally life-changing. It was an invitation to a life of discipleship. In those two little words, follow me, Jesus was saying, listen, Matthew, you can be like me. You can know what I know. You can do what I do. You don't have to be the best of the best. You don't have to be the smartest. You don't have to have the greatest education. You can be despised and an outcast of society. Follow me. Follow me and you'll be like me. I want you. I believe in you. Take my yoke upon you. Follow me. I know people hate you. I don't. When most people talk about discipleship, they talk about it in terms of, a, of it being a program or a class. And um, it's something that you sign up for and you do, you do once a week. And not infrequently, someone will say, hey, does Lighthouse have a discipleship class? And we do. <laughs> Jeff uh, told us about it, right, at, at announcement time. But listen, discipleship is not, you know, confined to a class. In, in, in reality, everything we do is discipleship. Life is discipleship. So, what we're doing right now is discipleship. Remember in the Great Commission, Jesus said, go into all the world, make disciples, teaching them what I've commanded you. Okay, that's happening right now. It's discipleship. In the New Testament, discipleship is presented not as a program, not as a ministry, not as something you do once a week. It's not some option you have when you, you know, sign up for the gospel. For Christianity. It's not like you get a gospel sign-up sheet and, and, you know, there's a bunch of boxes. Salvation, check, want that one. Blessings, absolutely, count me in. Discipleship, eh, not quite ready for that. So when you come to Jesus for salvation, discipleship is not optional. It's inherent in the call. That's what it's about. And it sounds radical maybe to some of our ears, but it's actually quite reasonable it's quite rational. Do you remember what Paul, fa famous verse, Romans 12, 1, what he said, I beseech you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable to him, that you may prove what is your reasonable worship. Reasonable. 
So therefore, Paul starts that verse with, there's an axiom in interpreting scripture that says this, when you come to the word therefore, ask what it's there for. So in Romans 12, 1, in this case, it links God's command for the believer to give his or her body. It links that with the mercies that Paul has been describing in the first 11 chapters of Romans. So in other words, when I consider my absolute lost and hopeless condition apart from the gospel, when I consider what Jesus had to do for me in order to save me, he had to come down from heaven's glory where he was worshiped as God. He, he was born in a lowly manger, lived a sinless life, largely misunderstood and despised and rejected in his life, tortured mercilessly, and then died in our place. The godly one, the holy one, in place of the ungodly ones, the unholy ones, absorbing God's wrath against my sin and yours then rising from death to liberate us from its clutches. And when I consider that I'm justified, I'm made right in God's sight by virtue of Jesus' death and resurrection and my simple faith in him, when I consider that I'm not merely saved from sin's penalty, but he's made me a son of God, a brother of Jesus, a co-heir of all that there is eternally, when I consider that I receive all of this freely by grace and, and, and I am inseparable from the love of God, nothing can separate me from it, then there's, there's no question at that point that it's perfectly right, perfectly reasonable, perfectly, perfectly rational that I should present my life to him and follow him and be his disciple. It's logical. It's biblical. You can't add Jesus to your life like some hobby. You know, well, I've, I have, I'm in this pickleball league. We do t Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then I join the church thing, so I do that on Sundays and Friday Bible study or whatever, and it's like this little compartmentalized thing. When Jesus bids a person to follow him, there isn't a menu of options. It's all of Christ for all of life. It's not one day a week. It's not six days a week. It's seven days a week, every minute of every day. We are disciples following Jesus. We go where he goes. We do our best to walk in the spirit and do what he does. A prayer I often pray, and I'll pray it with my wife a lot, Lord, Fill us with the Spirit. Help us to see with your eyes today. Help us to feel with your heart today. Help us to think with your mind today. Help us to move our feet with your feet today, to go where you go today. That's what disciples do. Jesus is a disciple maker. If we're gonna follow Jesus in discipleship, we must love him more more than anything, more than anyone. We must love him more than our spouse. We must love him more than our kids, more than our grandkids, more than ourselves. Jesus is a disciple maker. He calls and saves sinners who then become disciples, who then go and make more disciples. And this is the mission of the church in a nutshell, to make disciples of all nations. In our case, Idaho, in the U.S. of A. That's our primary mission. And so, as we'll see in a minute, only sinners can become saved and become disciples. Only sinners. That's the only ones who can become disciples. Even self-absorbed, hedonistic, drug-addicted, sexually obsessed narcissists can be saved and become disciples as I saw this past week on a video that I watched. Do we have it? <laughs> so, 
I'll have to describe it to you. This is really a letdown. <laughs> so I watched uh, Tucker Carlson is doing this, this series of live talks, and he had Russell Brand and uh, some Russell Brand friends. So, so anyway, they had a very interesting discussion, and at the end of the discussion, Tucker Carlson says, Russell, I don't know if this is, you know, putting you on the spot or whatever, but, but would you close us in prayer? Okay, they're in a packed auditorium, thousands of people, and it's going to be seen by mil literally millions of people. It's gone viral. Russell Brand gets out of his chair, kneels on the st stage, and begins to pray a very humble, powerful prayer to Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior. And he was not ashamed to tell planet Earth that he follows Jesus. He took the opportunity that was before him, and he said, Lord, I want to make you proud. I'm your disciple. And it was very, very powerful. Jesus is a disciple-making savior, and he takes people like tax collectors, like former actors and comedians who were living hedonistic lives. That's who, that's who he calls sinners to follow him. So he's looking for lifelong followers who will learn of him and live for him and do the things that he does. So following Jesus is, is it's an all-encompassing thing. So secondly, Jesus is the spiritual physician, verse 15. And as he reclined at table in his house, meaning Matthew, the tax collector's house, Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick do. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So Matthew, who is a wealthy guy in a big house, invited all of his tax collector buddies to come over for a celebration. Maybe it was a going away party, we don't know, but he wanted his buddies to meet Jesus and, uh, and his other disciples. So the disciples are there, Jesus is there, and all the publicans and the, the sinners are there. So let's be honest, this was probably awkward for Peter and John and Peter and Andrew and James and John and the, the disciples, like, gee, I mean, we're kind of pushing it here. Like, we, we hated these people just a few hours ago, and now, like, you called one of them, and now we're in his house. I'm sure we've all been at a wedding reception where there's various factions, <laughs> and it's uncomfortable, like, uh, let's, and everybody kind of groups up into their own little group. I'm sure Peter and Andrew and James and John were kind of off in their own little corner like, eh, what do we do? So Peter and the guys are processing this, this crazy thing that is happening. They're watching Jesus, their rabbi, and their presuppositions about people are being challenged and destroyed. Okay, I want to I wanna tell you that when you follow Jesus, your presuppositions about people are gonna be destroyed. You're gonna, you're gonna look at people differently. The Pharisees are there, probably not in Matthew's house, I don't think, it's hard to tell, but when some disciple uh, gets in vicinity of the Pharisees, they question, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? In the Luke account, they say, man, he's a, he's a, a glutton and a wine bibber. They're accusing him of, you know, over-partying. He's eating too much and he's drinking too much wine, which of course he wasn't. Jesus caught wind of their, their question and he came out, he answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician. Those who are sick do. I didn't come to call righteous people. I came to call sinners. That's who I'm here for. 
In the Jewish mind, to eat with someone in their home, it was to become one with them. Everyone, typically, there'd be a loaf of bread and uh, it would be passed around. Everybody would tear off a hunk off of that one loaf of bread. They would dip it in the sop or the stew. And so everybody's eating out of the same pot of stew, taking from the same loaf of bread. They dip it in there and they eat it. So everybody's assimilating the same food out of the same bowl off of the same loaf and, and symbolically and even literally to a degree. They're becoming one with each other. Jesus was telling the Pharisees, there's no one too bad for me to save. There are many who are too good for me to save. Jesus is the great physician who has the absolute 100% effective cure for the disease of sin, no matter how bad the disease is in any, any person. So, thirdly, He's the joyful groom, the joyful groom, verse 18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. So John the Baptist, right? His disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. So John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, right? And the Pharisees had something in common. They fasted regularly. John the Baptist was famously an ascetic. That is, he was hard on his body. He lived out in the wilderness, and he, he you know, ate bugs with honey on them, and he wore camel's hair. He was like a wild guy. And so this was his expression of his faith in God. And the Pharisees fasted twice a week. And so they're together on this. But in Matthew 3, verse 7, John the Baptist says about the Pharisees, you brood of vipers. So he was not on the same page with anything else, but they both practiced fasting. So the Pharisees see that Jesus' disciples are not fasting. And Jesus then tells a little story that when the wedding celebration is happening, nobody's fasting. In fact, during the week-long celebration, in, in Jewish first century cel wedding celebrations, it was a week-long celebration, rabbis declared that joy was more important than observing religious rituals. So the religious rituals were put on hold for that week. So in the days of Jesus, some rabbis declared even that if the observance of any law came in the way of having a joyful good time during a wedding, you do not keep the law. So there's something that's superseding the law at that point. So you could just go and just have that good time and celebrate the wedding, celebrate the couple. From Adam Clark, biblical theologian, historian guy, quote, marriage feasts were times of extraordinary festivity and even of riot among several people of the East, several peoples of the East. So it was a boisterous, loud, joyful week of celebrating the happy couple. Jesus says, the bridegroom is here. It's not appropriate for my disciples to fast. This is a day of joy. Jesus' message was, was bold and clear. I'm not like the Pharisees or John the Baptist. I'm the Messiah, the bridegroom to the people of God. Wherever I am, it's appropriate to have the joy that we associate with weddings. Joy, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Fourthly, Jesus is the new wine. He's the new wine. Mark 20, uh, 2, 21. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth 
on an old garment. If he does, the patch wears away from, tears away from it and the new from the old, and it's worse, a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into an old wine skin. If he does, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is destroyed and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skins. So Jesus is drawing this, painting this picture. Like if you've got, you know, uh, your trousers and you've got holes in them like I do, but there's patches on there and it's an old garment and you put new new material on there to patch it and you wash it and so on that the patch is going to shrink and it's going to tear away um, from the trousers. It's, going to, it's not properly connected, right? So a new patch on old trousers or new wine in an old wine skin. You put wine into an old wine skin, which is, you know, it's shrunk up as far as it'll go. The new wine is going to begin to expand and, uh, and uh, what is it when it becomes alcohol? Uh, ferment. It ferments. So we have, Pam and I have, we have vines, grape vines in our, in our yard and Pam took up winemaking last year and, uh, and so it's kind of crazy, uh, you know, stomping grapes. No, we didn't stomp them, I'm just kidding. But at any rate, the wine ferments and it expands. And so if you put it in an old wineskin, well, that, that old wineskin is going to burst at some point because of the pressure. So what Jesus is saying, there's, there's something new happening here. And you're, you're hanging on to this old system that you have, but you need to understand is that, that there's new wine being poured out and it needs a new wineskin. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul said, uh, here is the mystery of God. Uh, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Mystery, meaning that which was, was hidden from view in Old Testament times. The law was given by Moses, or through Moses, and grace came through Jesus Christ. So Jesus was alluding to them that a new day is coming, that this Old Testament, this old covenant is going to flower into fruition where not only are you be, being called into a covenant with God where you keep his external law, uh, laws, no, now God is making a covenant where he comes to dwell inside of you and he helps you to walk in newness of life as a new creature in Christ. This is new wine. This is a new day. One more. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Lord of the Sabbath. Mark 2, 23. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, the disciples began to pluck heads of grain. Now, it's likely it's corn, the Greek word there, and the, most guys think it was corn, regardless. The Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God, the tabernacle, in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath. The Son of Man, that's Jesus, is the Lord of the Sabbath. There were 613 commandments in the Old Testament, but the Pharisees, or rather the, the rabbis in the intertestamental period in particular, created over 1,500 additional what they call fence laws fence laws. So 613 actual commandments in the word of God for the Old Testament Jew. But religious leaders felt like they needed to put up other rules and other regulations as fences so that people couldn't get near the actual command of God to break it. Does that make sense? So, so in our backyard, okay, we have an apple tree. We have a command. We've given Stark, our dog, a command. Thou shalt not eat the apples. That is the word of your owners. Thou shalt not eat the apples. So what does Stark do? 
He eats the apples. Of course he does. So I put up a fence around the tree. And so literally put up a fence around the tree. So the, the, the initial command, start, don't eat the apples, but I know you're going to do it. So I'm going to put up a fence around there. And he still gets through that thing somehow anyway. I can't stop him. But the point is, the word of God had the command. The rabbis added more and more and more and more and more. And fenced it out to where it became just unbearable to try and even know, what are we supposed to, I'm not sure if this is legal or, I don't know. The rabbis believed the best way to keep people from breaking God's law was to build this protective barrier. More law. The people of Jesus, they, they were burdened down by man-made legalistic rules that God never commanded. Exodus 20.10 says, do not work on the Sabbath day. That's Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Don't do any work. So the Pharisees created, or the rabbis rather, created 39 types of prohibited work so that no one would break. The, so they just began spelling it out. Regulations, regulations. And within those 39 categories were subcategories of regulations. So to, to follow the rule of not working on the Sabbath, there were literally thousands of sub rules you had to follow, including how many steps you could take, how many letters you could write on the Sabbath. You couldn't spit on the Sabbath because it would disturb the dirt and you'd be uh, guilty of plowing the soil. You couldn't swat a fly on the Sabbath because you'd be guilty of hunting. You, a woman couldn't look in the reflection and, and because she might see gray hair and be tempted to pluck it, which would be doing work and on and on. I mean, just little trivial stuff. Well, you know, most average Jews in Jesus' day, they didn't even attempt to follow all that minutious stuff. But the Pharisees did. They prided themselves on following the minutia of the law, of going above and beyond what the law says. And when they saw Jesus and his disciples walking through a field, grabbing an ear of corn to gnaw on, they freaked out. Not because he, Jesus had broken a law and his disciples had broken a law, because in Deuteronomy 23, right around verse 25, it says that you are absolutely legal to do that. If you are hungry and you are in someone's field, you can take an ear of corn. It's abundant and it's a merciful law. You are allowed to do that to, you know, to feed yourself. But Jesus and his disciples did it on the Sabbath. This is what really torqued these guys off. So they were breaking one of the fence rules. Not the actual word of God, but the, one of the fences that they put up. So Jesus brings up David and his guys eating the show bread from the tabernacle. There were 12 loaves of bread in the holy place in the tabernacle, one for each tribe. And, and the priests would swap them out with fresh loaves once a week. And the priests were uh, welcome to eat the, the swapped out show bread. And it was only for the priests. David and his guys show up at the tabernacle and they were desperate. They were in need of sustenance. And David says, hey, how about the showbread? And the priest says, yeah, yeah, let's get the bread for you and your guys. You, you need it. And so the, the, simple, the simple lesson <laughs> is that human need is more important than religious ritual, okay? That, that, that's just basic. The way Jesus put it, uh, man is not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath for man. It's to be a blessing, not a burden. So no actual laws were broken. The Sadducees, another group we'll get familiar with later in Mark, and we'll, we'll bring this to a close, and, uh, but I, I want to get this under our belt. 
so we have it going forward. The Sadducees were the spiritual liberals of the day. They didn't, they didn't take the word of God uh, at face value. They didn't believe in the miraculous or the, the stories of the Old Testament. The Pharisees were the sp spiritual conservatives of the day who um, they believed in the word of God, but they added to the word of God. They added a bunch of stuff to it. So both are grave errors. Jesus then, then blew their minds when he said, listen, man wasn't made, made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man, and oh, by the way, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I created the Sabbath. I'm the boss of the Sabbath. I tell, I tell you what the Sabbath is, and I can change it if I want to. And I am the Sabbath for anyone who comes to me. <laughs> Hebrews 4 talks all about that, that Jesus is our Sabbath day's rest. So there's lots of Christian Pharisees running around who will attempt to pass judgment on you or me concerning all this kind of stuff. Sabbath, when do you go to church? What kind of church do you go to? Um, you know, what do you eat, drink, what do you, you know, what are your habits, whatever, all, all this stuff, and they will, they will pass judgment because if it doesn't line up with what their convictions are. So they'll attempt to make you inferior and make you feel less than because you, whatever, you ate or drank certain things or with certain people or you don't keep certain, you know, religious holy days. And if you're immature and insecure in your faith, these people can throw you for a loop because they're, you know, there, there's something in, in, especially in young Christians where, you know, you're not necessarily secure in the fact that you're complete in Christ. Listen, you are complete in Christ. So our maturity is to grow up into Jesus into greater and greater maturity over time not into somebody's peculiar idea of what the you know, rules of your life are, what you can watch on TV or what, whatever. Legalism appeals to the sense in most Christians that they're not doing enough, that they're not as good of a Christian as they should be. Has anybody ever felt like that? I have. It happens quite often, if I'm honest. So Paul wrote, Romans 14, 5, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. So some people consider some days to be holy and, and more important than others, and Paul says that's fine. Paul doesn't have a problem with that. The Christian with freedoms that you may not have and exercises them unto the Lord, the one who has freedom to drink alcohol doesn't have a problem with it, and you do have a problem with it. If you judge that person for drinking alcohol, now you're, you're putting something, you're judging them where the word of God doesn't judge them. The Christian who gets a tattoo of John 3.16 across their forehead, <laughs> which we would agree is not wise. However, they did so unto the Lord. And so, Romans 14, 6 says, the one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. So, so here's the thing, Jesus is gonna sort it out in the end. He's gonna totally sort all that stuff out, so you don't have to worry about it. You know, and you may think, well, there's no way that that guy, you know, who's saved, who has the tattoos or whatever. Listen, listen to this. We close here. Romans 14, 4. It's before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. You might think, he is such a carnal. His walk with God is so lame, whatever, because he doesn't, you know, have it dialed in like I do. And Paul says, 
your opinion doesn't matter nothing. It's all about his master. We're all going to stand before our master. Lord, we thank you that through the pages of scripture, we get to know you and we get to know your heart. And Lord, if we, if we have a, a tilt in our personality towards legalism and erecting fences, putting up more rules and regulations than, than what there actually are in your word, then I, I pray, Lord, that we would just in, in maturity, just recognize it and, and do our best to have the kind of heart reflected in Paul here and reflected in you in our chapter this morning. You love sinners. You came to save sinners. You went right up to one of those foul, nasty tax collectors. Said, I want you to be with me. I want to walk with you day by day. I want to teach you stuff. I want to use you to spread the word of my kingdom. Doesn't matter that people have rejected you. Doesn't matter what the public opinion is. I love you. And I want you. Follow me. Lord, we love your heart. Jesus may be saying to someone here this morning, follow me, like he did to Matthew that day. And maybe you found yourself on the outside looking in. Maybe you found yourself disenfranchised from your spouse or your family or whatever. Maybe you've done some stupid stuff. Well, it sounds like you're qualified to follow Jesus. He wants you. But it's not a, you know, pray a prayer and now I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. It's no, pray a prayer and surrender your life to Jesus to follow him all the days of your life, to do your best to honor him in your words, in your attitudes, in your actions, to grow in him day by day, knowing that one day our mortality is gonna give way to immortality. If you are ready to follow Jesus this morning, raise up your hand. Raise up your hand, good and high. And I'm gonna pray with you. And the Lord is gonna hear your prayer. It's a call to salvation. God bless you, sir, way in the back there. It's a call to discipleship. God bless you back here. Awesome. Anyone else? Listen, this is a moment that the Lord has foreseen. God bless you. Awesome. I love it. The Lord has foreseen this moment, and, and so just like he did with Matthew, he knew he was going to be cruising by that tax booth that day. And it was Matthew's day. Today is your day. Jesus has been in our midst and he's calling you. And it doesn't matter what your life has been to this point. So I want you to pray this prayer. Repeat it after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you, that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose from the dead. Lord, I place my faith in you now. Be my Lord and be my Savior. 
from this day forward, I want to follow you. So lead me on, Lord. And I will confess you before men, even as you will confess me before your Father. In your name I pray, amen, amen. Yeah, welcome those who prayed this morning. And then uh, if you're a believer here this morning, you are uh, invited to make your way to one of the uh, communion tables around the auditorium and get the bread and a cup, make your way back to your seat, and then we'll, we'll partake together in just a couple of short minutes. Jesus knew everything about Matthew, the tax collector, when he called him. Every time he overcharged somebody, every time he was dishonest in business, every immoral thing, Jesus knew all of it, every bit. That's who Jesus calls sinners. Christian, he knows you. He knows your life right now, every bit. And you have the freedom to open it up to, to him. Say, Lord, I'm sorry, but I've done some, some bad things. Lord, I've been, I've been carrying this grudge towards somebody and every time I see them or think of them, just it's just I knot up inside where I lied or I stole. The Lord invites you to freedom. Confess your sin. Lord, as we hold the bread before you this morning, we don't want to be, Lord, Christian Pharisees who, who just are obsessed over the externals and just wanting to look good to other people. But Lord, we want you to truly make us good. Like truly transform us inside out and you know, a good part of that is, is just being honest with you and candid. So thank you, Lord, that you were most candid there upon the cross as you hung and bled and died for us. Bless the bread now, your body. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's eat.
let's take the cup. Lord, the, the washing away of our sins came at such a great cost. The sinless, pure blood of God made man. So thank you that there is no sin we may have committed that could possibly not be washed away by your blood. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Bless the cup as we remember the nails in your hands, the nail in your feet. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's drink.
love you Lord you are our greatest treasure you are our life you are our future so help us Lord to walk with you this week to think with your mind and to see with your eyes the fields are white and the harvest and Lord to feel with your heart and to walk Lord with you in Jesus name we pray Amen. God bless you guys. Have an awesome week.